You complain about cars costing $40,000 or more, but take a look around you. This is one part of one car. All this has to go into that. To me, it's a miracle they're only 40 grand, yeah. right? I mean, like the more you learn about this kind of stuff, the more you're like, how do you make a car for $40,000? But still, you look at all this millions of dollars of stuff in here. All to make just one part of one car. Yeah, like, everything we look at here is just the front axle housing. If you wind up working in a machine shop, eventually you will find that you start to look at the world a little bit differently over time. All these mundane things around you, you'll start to wonder to yourself, how do these get made and how do they get made for so cheap? Now me, I've been in machining my entire life and one thing that I've always found fascinating is cars. I've really always been shocked at how cars can be so cheap. I know $30,000 is a lot of money, but $30,000 for all those parts and the fact that 99.9% .9 of the time they work perfectly, that's insane. insane. So today I'm gonna take you on a journey. I'm gonna show you a place where we're gonna make just one part of one car. And I think you're gonna be very shocked at the amount of automation that goes into that. So let's go there. So the place we're heading to today is called Dana Incorporated. Now, Dana has been around for over a hundred years. And during World War II, they even made tanks to help the allies win the Second World War. But now that the Second World War is obviously over, they mainly focus on automotive parts. So that is exactly what we're gonna show you when we get there. So we are here at the Dana plant. Why are you so weird? I don't know. This is Alex, he's an applications engineer with us at Dynamic. Not sure if you can hear me or if I'm yelling or whatever because it is loud in here, so Alex, Walk us through all this craziness because really everything you've told me so far is actually pretty mind blowing. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. So this whole automation cell, we have two machines, they're running like a mirror image. We have two robots feeding them and one robot packing out all of our parts at the end of the cell. What? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a pretty crazy operation and set up here. Walk us through what the heck all this stuff is because this is my first time seeing it. You got a lot of crazy stuff going on here. So walk us through it. So the first thing we have here uh, we have our parts coming in in our dunnage. There's a camera up top. The PN system is taking a picture of where all those parts are in the bins. The robot then decides which part is easiest for it to grab. It goes in there, picks the part out of the bin with a magnet, and then brings it over to this station here. So what do you mean by easiest to grab? Like it, it'll prioritize parts at the top. So, so you're telling me if I just mix all those parts up, that robot would be able to figure yeah. out? Really? Yes. That's pretty crazy. With the forklift, I'm guessing, they just bring these giant pallets of parts in here. Yeah. And they just start going through the process, so the robot picks it up. What is this? So this first station here is checking the overall length of the part. All right. So if it gets a short part or a long part, it will automatically reject it to this uh, bin right here, right on the back side. Oh, all right. It's a small bin, so there's probably not that many rejections, right? Yeah, it only gets three parts before it'll fall out. All right. Uh, this line runs nine different parts. So that's why they verify the overall length. Oh, in case someone brings, the wrong you're running of part, part seven and they bring part eight over. Exactly. It is loud in here. It is very loud it in here. It is so loud in here. I can see you have ear pro in. I, did, I, I haven't I've been in here in like a year. <laughs> I'm curious if they can even hear us over that thing. <laughs> uh, second station there that we can see, yeah. it's buffing one end of these tubes. Why? Uh, they get press assembled and then welded. So the, Here, or this is machining, right? Yeah, so. this is only machining. Okay. Uh, welding is a different process. Jeez. I think they're actually doing them on those weld cells over there. All right. So it's it's, it's grinding the bar down to a size, is that, or is it just cleaning it up? It's actually not taking any size off of it. It's just taking up the uh, mill scale. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Make it more consistent for welding. Yeah. You could smell the belt sander-ish, whatever that is, I could smell that. Yeah. From like when you're grinding something with a belt sander and it's really wet, it, yeah, you don't really, yeah. yeah. yeah you never get used to it. You never get used to it. So after the parts are ready, um, they'll get brought over to the machine. The machine has a cylinder here that aligns the part to that hard stop we see on the far side. That just makes it consistent for the robot gantry in the machine to pick up the part All at right. the exact same spot every time. So then it goes into machining, but normally with fast cut, you have an outboard conveyor. I'm only seeing it in. So the outfeeds are on the back side, and we have one gantry that's loading and unloading. So gantry comes in, pulls the part out, I'm guessing comes up, goes over it, back yeah. and then over there. So we have a short cycle time here. We'll see it on the next part that gets loaded. All right. There's actually two grippers on the gantry. One has an additional axis, so it can bring the part up to clear the spindle for the um, unload gripper to grab the part out of the spindle. That's crazy. 
So I did that video on it. Is the gantry system at all the same as far as the video I did? Oh yeah, it is. It's similar. So S1 is still similar. I mean, it it's looks your manual controls for your grippers and stuff. Is like that, that how it always works on fast cut? S1 is almost always your yes. manual controls. All right. So we'll see. That gripper there is up out of the way. That's our next part coming in. This gripper here is able Pulls to grab the part out of okay. the spindle. And then we're using the hard stop on the, the system one current. What are you doing to it? Are you turning both ends or just one end? Uh, so on these parts, we're only turning the one end. Obviously the end that is not buff. Right. Uh, there are a set of parts that do get turned on both ends, but they are symmetrical. So we do have our, we're using boring bars because we need to be able to reach into that spindle there. So, all right, so the parts are going in. Can we go around the back and yep. see them coming out? Yeah. Watch your step. I'll be honest, I haven't been at like a real shop in like six months. I forgot what this is like. I've been making YouTube videos for way too long because this is so crazy. Good grief, there's robots back here too. Yeah. All right, so that's your out conveyor. Yeah, so these are outbeat conveyors. Dude, look how big that robot is. I've been staring at the cube box the last like six months, right? I haven't seen a robot like that since I've been back. Yeah, and this is our biggest part that we're running right now. So it's not a big robot for capacity. It just needed the reach. It's crazy that, I mean, what else gets done to this part? I believe it just gets pressed into its final assembly and then welded next. For what, like some drivetrain part of some it's car? It's a front axle. Crazy, but the axle goes through it, I'm guessing, right? It's like the cover. Yeah, right? this is the actual axle tube, so the differential will be in the middle. Okay. And then the knuckles on the end where your wheels actually attach. So That's crazy. This will be cool once these trays fill up. Oh, there's two fast cuts. Yeah. yeah look at that. Yeah, so you got, you got fast cut one right here and fast cut two over there. Now, can they do different parts or are they, are they both running the same part all the time? They're always running the same part because they're fed from the same cell. So the oh, parts all, duh. Yeah, okay, part yeah. types always have to match. So one pallet's put in, yep. that's loaded up. That's pretty crazy. Holy crap, that robot is moving, dude. And I, I think this is only about 80%. It, it was going faster, but they slowed it down to just keep up with the machine. There, there was no sense That's of scary, the that's, that's a lot of mass. Yes. Like whipping around, like if that, if you got in the way of that, dude, that's game over. That's what I constantly think of. Same. Seeing stuff move around here, that's a lot of mass. Yeah. It's like on the horizontals. That oh, whole dude. Column moving and it wraps so to within one tenth yeah. every time. Just, it blows my mind. Yeah, it's always my first thought. Like, that's a lot of mass. Man, it is loud in here. Yeah. I'm curious if you can hear anything I'm saying. So, what do they They get stacked up in trays here? Yeah, so they, they get packed out here. Um, once a layer is full, the robot, each one of these trays actually has a metal plate in it. In it. A metal what? A metal plate okay. right in the center. So, the robot magnet will actually come over and transfer an empty tray on top of these. Really? Yeah. It does two trays per row. Like the part looks simple, but when you think about non-stop 24 hour yeah. production, that's a different story than, oh, I could load this in my lathe by hand and do it in 10 seconds. Yeah, but you're gonna go home. Yeah, getting our getting our first good part on this project was, I think took two days after the machine had power, but then getting it to run continuous reliably has been well, you can't do that without sitting there and burning up tools. You know, that's one thing people don't get. Like, production like this, this is, you're gonna have this optimized to a point where you can only go maybe 1% better. Yeah. But then it becomes a how often do you wanna change the tools question, right? You can't just do this in five seconds. Exactly. You know, it, it, it's, it takes a lot to dial something in like this. Yeah, Man, we that went robot through quite moves. a few tools getting it dialed in. I'm sure. What, what company did you wind up going with, with for your inserts? So they came with this car insert. Yeah, I'm just looking at how that robot works. So it looks like those three motors, I'm guessing each one of those has like a shaft going to the different axes of the robot, right? Yeah, and that'd be a better question for yeah. Robot Steve. Robot Steve, yeah, I'll ask him. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented. I gotta assume that's what it is, because they all have an encoder. Yeah, I think they're like coaxial shafts and then a weird planetary gearbox in the elbow. Yeah. That allows it to translate the servo motion. That's one thing I feel like people who watch this kind of stuff, they don't realize all that's going on inside that robot to make it move that accurately and quickly. Yeah, because that thing is moving. Dude. That horizontal servo right there, that's joint three. There's three more beyond it. Yeah, and, and that's at the end, right? You got to get all the way to the end of that yeah. and control that with just rotary motor movements. So at what point 
is it going to say the trays are too high and uh, slide them out? At what point does it do that? We do six layers. Six layers? So one of these, uh, these are pre-positioned with yeah. six empty trays in it. So it will leave the very bottom one on that far tray. It will shuttle this one out, shuttle the next empty one over, and an operator will have this stacked up ready to go. So this will just keep running. So when you got here, when you first got here, what did this look like? I mean, was were, it just the fast cuts or were the robots here or what? The robots were in place, nothing was bolted down and there was no fencing or guarding. The, the machines had gotten power the day before I got here. And when did you get here? Uh, first week of September. That Do you was, know what year car this is for? It's gotta be like uh, 2028, right? It can't be anything new. Well, these are current models. This is replacing an outdated line. Really? So these are 2018 and newer. Really? Yeah. All right, yeah, usually you don't hear that in automotive shops. Usually it's like four years from whatever you're driving now is what they're working on, but that's Jeep pretty crazy. Jeep will keep selling you the same thing for decades. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's kind of like their whole brand, right? Yeah. If you want to see what's going on next, you can see right here. Yeah, you can see the robot. Just be a little careful looking in there as far as the welding. You might not see it, but that robot, they're pressing these guys on. Is it cool if I grab this for a second? Thank you. So yeah, this guy right here. So the part you're turning gets pressed in here or the part they were deburring? So the or, part the part that got buffed gets pressed into this All end. right, so the part that gets buffed goes here and, and then the turning part's going out here. Yeah, you'll you'll see our turn part here oh, yeah. that we just ran and that'll get pressed into the differential housing. All right. Man, they even have, they even have like special crates for every part of the operation. That's crazy to me. It's not just like standard crates like you can't put a part in wrong, you know, like it has to be right. That's pretty crazy. But here, so you don't have to look through the cage. Yeah, that's them finished. Wow, look at that weld. I can feel the heat from the welding that just got done. I can feel the heat coming off these things on my hands. That's crazy. You complain about cars costing $40,000 or more, but take a look around you. This is one part of one car. All this has to go into that. It's a, to me, it's a miracle they're only 40 grand, yeah. right? I mean, like the more you learn about this kind of stuff, the more you're like, how do you make a car for $40,000? I, I, I get numbers as what the answer is, but still you look at all this millions of dollars of stuff in here, all to make just one part of one car. Yeah, like, everything we looked at here is just the front axle housing. That's it. Yeah. You still have the real axle housing, the axle, the Plus engine, all the gears, all the gears in. everything. It's crazy. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot that goes into it. Now Dana mainly does just like drivetrain stuff, right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's what they've been known for. They've made the axles forever. Yeah, all right. right. So apparently one of the machines went down, so we get to see poor Alex here, what he's been dealing with for the last few months. Uh, this is something we've been fighting. What is it? What's going on? The alarm with the in-feed conveyor, see how it's not fully into position? What's it's causing it? Is it getting stuck on a chain or something? Well, if I knew, it wouldn't be happening. <laughs> That's a good answer. That's a fair answer. So yeah, this is basically what, what they have to do, right? You you put a machine in and like, you know, a liar will tell you you won't run into this stuff. But the truth is with automation on this level, you're gonna run into small little things and you'd be surprised how every little sensor, every little screw on this machine will pop up and cause a problem eventually. It, it, it's just the nature of what we do. So right now he was having a problem with the in conveyor. Not sure what it is yet, but that's the stuff you have to be prepared for when doing full automation. Name of the game. So how do you go about starting to solve a problem like this now? Because that's beyond what I know. I'll be honest, I don't know how to do that, so. It's a little beyond me as well. So I just found out that this machine has G8.5 on it, which is actually a chip breaking G code. What that means is it's going to create an oscillation pattern while it's cutting, which will break the chip no matter what. And on these automotive steel, stringy chips are typically a problem. So that's kind of a big deal. See these rails up here? All right, this is what the gantry rides along to load the part, right? So it's basically hung above the spindle and then loads the spindle below itself. And then this machine here has two turrets. Now, what I like about a machine like this is... Now, what I like about this machine is it actually uses the stop on this turret to locate this part. So instead of having an extra device, it uses the turret itself to bump up against, and then it can either turn both ends or one end and then the robot unloads the part. And come here, you can actually see the gantries like ready to load the part right now. I'll get out of your way. So
so it's kind of similar to what we have in the office as far as the size of the center drive spindle. A little bit different. There are so many different fast cuts out there, so yeah. So yeah, that's what it takes to make is something a, a something. Sorry. So yeah, that is what it takes to make something as simple as a tube, a part by itself that you would consider extremely insignificant until you saw it at a plant like Dana, where they've had to invest a ton of money into a full-blown automation cell to make it something special, something that is consistent that can go into a million cars and always be right. I think that's really cool once you kind of see it in that context. And on that note, I just want to give Dana a special thank you. Thank you so much for letting us come into your plant and film with our cameras and check out our automation cell we set up there. I really do appreciate that. Not everyone does that. So huge thank you to you guys. And thank you to you, the person who made it to the end of the video. Do appreciate it. And other than that, hope you have a great day.